Jeannie Naram has helped to improve both pedagogy and place, first with Project Kaleidoscope and now the Learning Spaces Collaboratory. So where'd PCAL come from? Well, it's kind of a um, long journey and an un unanticipated journey. So since people at NSF knew my, um, my, um, the world in which I moved in, and so they asked me to convene a group to outline an agenda for NSF. And so I started with a small group of seven, and then that group expanded it to 28. And so it was really, it's quite serendipitous that um, um, I was there at the right time. And NSF Timing counts. <laughs> Timing counts. Timing counts. And um, one of the things we, we, we remember, the small group that, that first met with Bassam, um, he looked at us and he told us how important this was. And he said, remember, don't point the finger, point the way. And so this was a charge for us to look That's toward brilliant. the future rather than doing what so many other reports then and now do, which is recount the, the challenges and the problems without saying this is a potential solution to the problem. So as you began to look to the way, for the way to the future, where did that, where did that finally lead? So we had a meeting at the National Academy of Sciences in February 1991, um, packed. We were turning people away. So this was an interesting time when there were a lot of people starting to become interested in trend, or thinking about different ways of learning. Um, and we again required, if you came, you had to come with an institutional team with the president and, and people with fiscal responsibility. And so it had to be an institutional team. So we didn't ever... Um, we, we tried to, from the first, first kind of serendipitously and then intentionally saying, change is an institutional culture change. And so even when we started doing, um, you know, focusing on introductory courses in the disciplines, um, it was still the keynote was a biologist or a chemist or a physicist who could talk about the broader institutional issues in change within a department which mirrored each other. And so we, we had our meeting, kind of packed up our tents, and then people kept calling us and saying, you know, what are you doing next? And what we did in the early days of Project Kaleidoscope was we, we went out and got collaborators. So we brought in the uh, MAA, the American Mathematical Association, the uh, AAPT, the physicists, the ACS, the chemists. So we were, we always made connections to these people when we were looking for what's an exemplary um, STEM learning environment. We went and found them through the um, assistance of, of others. So we, we were building a network to begin with. I, I sat one day in my office and I was thinking about our, our project and I thought, you know, we're really doing, we're building a kaleidoscope here. And a kaleidoscope has to pay attention to everything that we're doing. We aren't just doing, we're not changing physics 101, and we're not kind of um, building new kinds of undergraduate research labs so students don't have to sit in attics, research students, but they could work with their... What we are doing is building communities. You moved from uh, labs, we'll call them, STEM environments, not right. just labs, right. but that constellation of places to learning spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about that. Well, it, it, it was very interesting as we kind of continued to do workshops on the, the pedagogy and the institutional change, and Project Kaleidoscope had a large dimension of focus on campus leadership. Developing young faculty, um, kind of building communities, learning to talk to each other, and so the, the building community stayed as a major theme through what we were doing. And as we began to um, send reports back to our funders, which is always an important thing, we had support from NSF, um, from the Keck Foundation and from the Exxon Foundation, it became clear to us that the institutions that were moving forward and more sustainability on transforming the learning environment were mm -hmm. giving attention to the spaces too. Okay. So the, the groups that came um, if they were just on the pedagogy, you know, they kind of went home, right. 
but they didn't have this collegial network of bringing in, you know, eventually the IT people, the assessment people, and and so when it was when the question was around space, and when there was an aha moment on a campus that this is a capital investment and we better get it right. I mean, faculty development is the other capital investment, but you know you can evolve that. But once you build something, you better get it right for the future. And so it was very interesting to, um, it was almost, not quite an aha moment, but you know, the kind of things fell into place. So, so then we began to develop a body of literature. You know, in 1995, we published um, Structures for Science, um, which was a, as everything with Project Kaleidoscope was, a definitely collaborative effort. So I'd call up a dean and say, um, you know, you're, you're now you're three years out of your the planning for your new building. The dean's perspective, you know, I needed something the architect's perspective. Um, but we kept gathering the, the 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 reports back. We took I kept copies of every one of the presentations from the architects or the campuses. So there was a great body of wisdom. We expanded in 2002 into learning commons and high tech classrooms. Ah. Okay. So I had these two parallel sets of groups, and it's been wonderful to go back now. And what is coming up can I, on the LSE website um, are ideas about how to move forward that were captured from um, workshops. So you see, you see the Learning Spaces Collaboratorium as a logical evolution of the set of ideas you've been working on. Yes. So one of the um, early things I did with the, with the um, LSC is go to the National Science Foundation and say, remember you supported before with the facilities work? Mm -hmm. And um, we'd like to start to gather some stories which say where we are now and how spaces make a difference to the, to the quality of the learning to the kind of mental image of faculty about mm -hmm. how learning happens. Yeah. It makes a difference at the institutional level about why investing in, in the physical space is an investment in the future of the institution. And most important, that all of these research-based pedagogies had spatial implications. All of the things society was calling for its graduates to have had spatial implications. Um, what you want to do in the learning environment is have them come to the um, the aha moment that oh this is what a chemist does hey, I would like to be a chemist and this has spatial implications because one has to practice to understand this so the different venues for practicing a space um, it has to do with having pervasive photos and and you know the the nuts and bolts of what what the field is whether it's dance or history or law. That there's kind of you're you're embraced by a, a, a environment that says this is what this community of practice does. Mm -hmm. Today, no undergraduates should study science in the first year without being ha being embedded in project-based learning. So it's a hands-on learning introductory course, um, and places are adapting this. But for campuses where faculty are still thinking that one needs to have students in a lecture course so they know everything they need to know before they start doing hands-on, um, this kind of um, disputes that, that kind of mental image of how learning happens. And what is your view of the long-term importance of place for, particularly for undergraduate education, but more broadly for higher education? I'm thinking of place as a, a, a campus with boundaries that this is the this is the campus, and I had a wonderful recent experience working on a campus, which is anticipating within the next two or three years to start thinking seriously about their science building. So we went in, I went in, and we had a wonderful conversation with a very mixed group, uh, you know, philosopher and anthropologist and artist, the provost, including the scientists. And the about getting a campus mindset focusing on that certain kinds of learning experiences really enhance the the learning outcome, the success of the students. And so, with with very little um, 
difficulty with some nudging from the provost. Um, they're going to spend a couple of months for the rest of the summer looking at learning spaces across campus, looking for low-hanging fruit where with very little or existing budget transfers, um, they can identify, they can kind of have a sense that student-owned spaces are important. You believe that place matters. Place matters. And, and I think it's remarkable to see the influence that this uh, approach, this set of ideas has had on not only the quality of education, but also the quality of the environments that uh, have, been, have been created. Recorded in Chicago, July 13, 2015.